Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today, will the future of money be counted in Bitcoin? We'll look at why so many people are staking their fortunes on this digital currency. With me is our digital producer Malika Valau. I don't know if she has any digital currency, do you? Not yet. Okay, not yet. We'll Maybe see what happens this show. By, the, by the end of the show. I love this conversation with our online community because mm. some of them are asking things like, what's Bitcoin? Right. And the others are trading. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we've got two communities, two levels of understanding mm -hmm. going on at the same time. And did bridge that gap, we mm. asked our community members to give us a word association. Tell us what they think of when they hear the word Bitcoin. We okay. got lots of responses. On Twitter, Fadil writes in, Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer payment system and a digital currency, giving us a straight definition. But Rio's a little more skeptical. He says it means cyber delusions. Ooh. Despite his skepticism, I want to show you this crowdsourced map we found online of all the places around the world that digital currency is currently used. So clearly it is popular. But of course, we want to hear from all all of you at home, whether you have Bitcoin or you don't, tweet us with your questions and your comments using hashtag AJStream. So I'm going to ask one of the first tweets straight away. Bitcoin is the world's most popular electronic currency. Created on the internet, it's fast gaining more acceptance from mainstream businesses and investors. Last year, Bitcoin's value grew by a staggering, wait for it, 9,000 percent and at one point was worth more than gold but its wild market fluctuations often make it the subject of criticism now governments are starting to pay attention last month china blocked bitcoin transactions for businesses and other countries are debating whether the system should operate with some greater oversight meanwhile advocates see the decentralized and unregulated payment network as a good thing a way to move around money without the control of governments and central banks so today we're going to discuss the potential benefits and the risks of digital currencies like bitcoin so to help us do that we have in las vegas eduardo jackson He's a self-described Bitcoin evangelist and social media director of the online gaming site Infinity Poker. In Austin, Texas, we have Daniel Beer. He's executive editor of The Skeptical Libertarian. And in New York, we have Sebastian Galli. He's a senior currency strategist with Societe Generale. So it's great, gentlemen, to have you all here in the stream. Let me start off with Eduardo. I have to say, Eduardo, got me hooked on bitcoin i only have five dollars actually i have a little bit more now because it's grown since eduardo gifted me a christmas present of a little bit of a bitcoin but eduardo when you go around being enthusiastic about bitcoin what is it that you tell people to encourage them they know nothing what do you tell them well i tell them it's like paypal without the banks I mean, it's both right. a currency that you can use to buy and sell stuff, and it's also a payment processing system. So think of how often you actually use cash these days. It's, it's pro unless you work in you know, a cash-related business, it's probably not very often. And so once I connect them to that, that idea that's almost like, like you using you know, PayPal or your debit card or something online, uh, people seem to get it. And then also when you throw in the fact that the transaction fees are like 0 .0002 you know, Bitcoin, just like 16 cents, I mean, they get it. Right, so that's really easy, that's sort of baby steps, but it gets a little bit more difficult than that. that Sebastian, amazing. where did Bitcoin come from? Bitcoin was uh, the invention of some uh, mysterious creator, a, uh, supposed to be a mathematician uh, out of Japan, uh, uh, but we're, we're still unsure. It's a series of code which was set up and has essentially been evolving since then, based on a very simple rule re regarding the creation of these bitcoins, the imagination behind it is a very utopian view of uh, the uh, the world, the economic world. It uh, is that there should be a certain amount of coins which are available, uh, which are created at a certain pace to reach a maximum amount of gold. The analogy behind it is similar to gold in California. So, if you imagine the 1900s, California was not really doing much. It was really there on the map. It was just conquered, I guess, from the Spanish. And at one point, some gentleman finds some gold, and there becomes a, a gold rush. More gold becomes available, and actually, since the economy is on the gold standard, then there was a huge pickup in growth. See, if I we love you put that, 
I love how Eduardo, he didn't say any of that. He just said, oh, it's like paper. It's really easy to move around. The thing is, though, Eduardo, mm -hmm. it's created from nothing, right? Yes, but that, that goes to the inherent question of what is value? How do you define yeah. value? And, and which gets into a little more, you know, esoteric discussion. But basically, you know, value is anything between two people that can agree upon an exchange. And so people say, oh, well, the U.S. dollar has value. Well, it has value because we put our faith in it. You know, it has value because we say it does. And, and besides the fact that it's highly, you know, regulated and manipulated in a lot of senses, uh, I like Bitcoin because more of, it's more of a freer market where it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Like we are directly, you know, defining its value. I, yeah, it. I, w I would deeply disagree. I would say that Bitcoin, the difference between the Bitcoin and, and dollars is that if you look at uh, Bitcoins, they're essentially created or owned by the guys who were there at the beginning of the process. They own large amounts of monies. Essentially, it's the same as being Goldman Sachs or uh, let's say a very large U.S. bank and being the printer of money, was, as was the case in the uh, 19th century. They own that creation process that makes uh, them very, very rich and that process means that people are, you know, see some of that profit potentially trickle down as more of these bitcoins become available and everybody gets excited, wants to participate in the same game. And that creates a very uh, strange process by which there is a conquest essentially of the West, of California, and then eventually a collapse, which we've seen a series of. So it's a deeply uh, speculative instrument uh, with great commercial aspects to it. And uh, unfortunately, there's a battle between the commercial aspect, which is great, and uh, some of the bizarre rules which were set up initially. So Daniel, yeah, I, I, I want you to weigh in here because we've heard uh, Sebastian and we heard what Eduardo had to say. Uh, listen first to what our community members are saying. I want you to have a listen to this video comment. The important thing to remember about Bitcoin is that it has changed people's perceptions and expectations about transferring money. For example, you can transfer money to anyone who has a wallet for free, uh, the transactions are quick, there are almost no fees except for the mining fee, and there aren't any arbitrary limitations and you don't have to have a bank account. So that what will that will definitely stick even if the bubble pops. Says there aren't that many limitations and that of course is something other people are picking up on. Bucky on Twitter says it's an emerging currency and most importantly it's a virtual one. So deep caution and research is invaluable. Tread with care. Now Daniel not too long ago, last year, you wrote a piece on your skeptical libertarian blog, Confession of a Bitcoin Skeptic. Why are you skeptical? Well, I'm skeptical because, uh, like any new technology, there's a lot of risks inherent in uh, early adoption. So there's, there's two aspects that we've sort of uh, picked up on here. One is Bitcoin's value as a payment system, as a way of transferring uh, uh, large amounts of money across, you know, virtually across the globe or you know, just between you and your neighbor uh, at very little cost. And that's great. That's a very innovative concept. There's a lot of potential for, uh, you know, open-ended growth there and different experiments and entrepreneurship. But there's also Bitcoin as currency, uh, as, you know, the actual Bitcoins that you have in your wallet and what you, can, what you can buy with them. And my concern is that a lot of people don't understand Bitcoin's limitations as money. Money is only valuable because you can exchange it for goods and services. And right now what we're seeing is a lot of people are just trading dollars for Bitcoin and back and forth, hoping for the value to appreciate as, as time goes on. And there isn't a whole lot of transactions involving Bitcoin for goods and services. So, that's, yeah, that's and, the reason, and the reason for this is because of the extreme volatility in price. Anything that can lose half of its value on a single day, it's very risky to accept that as a business. Imagine, you know, figuring out if you made a profit by the time a transaction went through during one of these wild swings in price. So there's a lot of reason to be skeptical and to be cautious about it. But there's also, you know, a, a, a great deal of innovation there. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens next. Let me take it to New Orleans and a, and a little transaction that, that's happened already because um, we've been talking about well it might be a little risky to use as a business so we're going to an antique store if you blink you're going to miss the payment that happened via Bitcoin have a look at this come over this way and look at our phones so we're gonna say send send and she says yes it's coming in let's see yeah there you go all right, now, what's the transaction fee on this? Wow. Uh, one cent transaction. 
One cent. One so cent. Expensive. Now let me ask you this question. If I used a major credit card, how much would it have been? For you. One dollar and fifty cents plus the thirty cents, so it will be one eighty. One eighty instead of one cent. A note to vendors everywhere. So that's a transaction using Bitcoin. So it's like, you know, you could do it on your smartphone, basically. I am looking at the current value of Bitcoin right now. So one Bitcoin is just over eight hundred and fifty three dollars. That's a lot. But it's been going up and down all day. I've been looking at this all day. So what if your value of, I don't know, you, you bought a chair for fifty dollars and then Bitcoin goes down and then you sold it to somebody for that amount, Eduardo. I could see that being quite complicated or someone's lost out. Well, a little bit, but uh, in, in, in addressing what Dan, Daniel said earlier uh, about uh, the volatility, and yes, it is, it, it's volatile right now because there's not much market depth to it. There's only the market caps around 10 or $11 billion you would take, which isn't very much considering the the largest hedge fund in the world is like at 83 billion. So uh, once more institutional money gets in there, it will help stabilize the price some. But right now, as far as transactions go, I disagree. There are actually a lot of transactions happening on the Bitcoin net on the Bitcoin network these days because you have innovative companies like BitPay and Coinbase who have uh, who instantly uh, change exchange at point of sale a Bitcoin to dollars or whatever currency uh, you accept. Uh, at, so that there's no uh, counterparty risk when they right. make the sale. Okay. Well, Femi, you know, you just showed the markets from today. And, of mm -hmm. course, the, uh, our community members shared with us uh, this on my screen here, which is a point to say that this is very tran this is very transparent. You can see exactly what's going on since the markets across a period of time. So you can actually watch how it fluctuates. Uh, and, and our community members are saying, Sebastian, that this goes against our traditional banking system and then that's a good thing michael osterlink tweets in bitcoin is good as a market challenge to the federal reserve and so-called notes in of central banks of course you work in uh, the the banking business what do you say to that well it's a, it's the creation of these parallel monies or private monies have been going on for decades in the 1920s uh, in mm -hmm. europe they had to create them because they were missing uh, in the War of Secession, they had to create coinage because the coinage was not available and you needed that coinage for transactions. So it, it has a, a role to play which is very significant. The reason why it always becomes regulated after a while is uh, several folds. One is because the monies are generally profitable at the beginning. There is, uh, you know, the creation of money initially means that the first people in the process earn a significant amount of money. Um, and generally that's considered a bad thing and that's just essentially socialized. That's the entire uh, w um, country basically which uh, should benefit from that process and the monies essentially are transferred from the Federal Reserve to the US Treasury. So, so Sebastian, a, why is this taking off though? There's one story, I'm just going to pull it up on my computer, which was amazing. It was a, it's an amazing story. Don't come to my computer yet because I'm just finding it. The story was about the day when Bitcoin was worth there's more $5. than actually gold. Like yes. that's amazing. Yeah, that's when you so know something's really wrong. So it's really taking off. Oh, that, well, that's, that's, that's bad. Well, because is right. No, Sebastian. The thing about gold is that it, it costs so much to get even like a significant amount of gold. Whereas with Bitcoin, you can buy it for very little and you can watch it grow. I call it the gift that truly keeps on giving. I gave my mom like uh, $20, at, which was 0.1 Bitcoin at the time, for her birthday back in late October. And now it's, over, it's worth over $85. You know it's why? The, the reason is because the Bitcoins have now been used in Asia. It reached a new population. Essentially, whenever it reaches a, a new population in here, probably in the Middle East, that population then goes in and tries to open Bitcoin accounts because it's a rational thing to do to want to participate in, in a speculative investment, even especially so because uh, they don't put a lot of money into it. As they do so, we know the amount of people coming in. And I have a lot of friends who are traders who are playing with Bitcoins because it's a very easy market. You know the demand coming in. You know the supply is deeply inelastic. Aye. That means there's a very limited supply of coinage. That means it's a market which is built for speculative bubbles, and they know how to play bubbles. So, <coughs> you know, your grandma and, and myself, if uh, ever I, I would uh, dare own one of these Bitcoins, benefit significantly, and that process will continue up and down 
for, for a significant amount of time before uh, we come to a, a more uh, severe conclusion a few years down the road. All right, let me just jump back into the community. Malika. Well, Sebastian mentioned that it's an easy market, and, and I think that begs the question online. People are saying, does this need regulation? Anonymous Kenya tweets in, regulate Bitcoin, though, and see its meaning and its value lost. Internet digital currencies need more clearinghouses, not more government intervention. Daniel, I... Uh, I think it's safe to assume where you fall on that, but I'd like you to explain for our audience. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly libertarian person. I think people should be able to, uh, you know, live basically with very little interference from the government. So I would say that regulation uh, of Bitcoin is probably going to significantly, uh, you know, hurt the value uh, of, of current users. Um, however, I do think it's probably inevitable. If Bitcoin does become large enough to, uh, you know, be a substantial threat to government's ability to control financial markets and to regulate collect taxes and all sorts of other things, I think governments are you're really going to start seeing, you know, more, more and more, uh, as we're already seeing in China, governments cracking down on Bitcoin markets. There's something so, that we brought up in a conversation. This is really important because I actually want to get quite. A little bit more complex than we've been we've been talking about it as an easy way to move money around that it might be a big investment bubble and everybody might lose their money or their bitcoin by the end of the year something about bitcoin mining is really intriguing i'm going to start with eduardo do you want to explain what bitcoin mining is because i i did a little workshop this morning i if i if i had a fast enough computer could sit at my computer and make or mine bitcoin how is that possible i just have a, a really layman's uh uh, view of, of Bitcoin mining. It's, it's basically, it's, it's the way that uh, transactions are, are processed on the blockchain, that big transparent website that uh, that shows every transaction in the Bitcoin network. And and basically the, the miners, who, you know, people who have these, you know, somewhat elaborate uh, uh, hardware and software rigs uh, to their computers, uh, they're, they're the ones who are rewarded for processing transactions on the blockchain uh, with, you know, Bitcoin. And because, uh, and so you're because basically the, asking your computer to do mathematics, and that yeah, yeah, that and mathematics yeah, lot, yeah, makes they, money. Like, it solves like complex problems or, or, or algorithms, whatever. And for their 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 efforts, they get rewarded with with piece of Bitcoin. See, and this before, is what's blowing my started, mind because that's really hard to get your head around. It's like you're just making money on your laptop. That's weird. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's getting harder to make that money though because uh, actually, as as uh, Sebastian uh, intimated earlier, that yes, the early adopters, you know, you know, were got a lot of the early Bitcoin because they're it's easier to get. But as as the processing power um, increased and and the and the problems got more more complex, uh, they started forming pools, mining pools, right. you know, people banding together to mine collectively so they can make money because now it's really hard to to earn Bitcoin mining All unless right. you unless you have some help. See, I'm um, Malika, go ahead. He mentioned the mining pools. Uh, Fadl tweets in, participants known as miners verify and timestamp transactions into a shared public database, and it's called a blockchain. So he's explaining it for the rest of our audience. Uh, but uh, Daniel, I'd like you to know your thoughts on this mining pool and whether or not that basically means that to actually work the system well, you need to be a miner. Well, I... Uh, you know, early on, I would say being a miner was extremely valuable uh, because the, basically the math problems that you had to solve were very simple. So your your standard laptop could do it. But you know, as the blockchains uh, you know are uh, become longer, uh, it sort of throttles the amount of bitcoins that have been created, and that's sort of the feature of the system. There's a limited number of bitcoins right. available, uh, and so right now your ordinary laptop probably would not be able to generate a lot of bitcoins. Uh, right there's uh, there's whole groups of people with dedicated hardware called uh, drills, which all they do are just these large computers or networks of computers uh, to drill for uh, uh, bitcoins, basically, uh, by solving these complicated problems. So uh, it's just like any, it's just like you know, mining for gold. You know, once you pan everything out of the streams, you know, yeah. your average person isn't really going to be able to get it, and you need uh, more investment to uh, to really be able to get. It. I'm going to show our audience an image on my laptop, which I love this image because it just made me smile. I had $5 of Bitcoin for Christmas. It's now $6.21. I've done nothing to it. It just sat there and made that money. But this is a, a fantastic little gift, which is a, a little Bitcoin and a roller coaster going up and down and up and down and up and down. So, Sebastian, just very briefly, tell our audience who are thinking about Bitcoin, tell them 
why you think they should or shouldn't go for it? Just very briefly, then I'm going to go to Eduardo, because I know you have two very different points of view. Well, the Bitcoin is essentially is a, a rat maze for very intelligent people. Uh, essentially, they, uh, they focus on, on the mining aspect of it. Uh, they're very, very bright guys. They're extremely bright, actually. And the right strategy, as I was pointed out earlier, was uh, essentially mining was, was the right strategy. Now it's switched right. to investors waiting out for new people to come into the market. And what they do is they wait for the release of this money. Generally, the price then accelerates ahead of the release. And then they sell into it. So, so that's the strategy is, followed by traders. You've got to be super smart to even try this. Is that what you're saying? Well, you used to have to be super smart. Now yeah. you just need to be a good trader. So there are a lot of people investing uh, in Bitcoins right now who are professional traders and doing it on the side. They're very good at trading. All right. uh, there have also been institutional investors, quote unquote, hedge funds, okay. which apparently and reportedly have uh, started to uh, try to put some uh, Bitcoin funds. So it, it, the answer is if you're a speculator, uh, it's it's a it's a very yeah, interesting I, market. All right, Sebastian, let me go to Eduardo. Eduardo. Of, of the biggest innovation that Bitcoin brings, which is the payment processing system. I, I think while yes, there are there is trading. I, I like a, like tell a friend of mine, you know, day trading Bitcoin is a bit of a fool's errand because there are very few indicators that let you know when or how it's going up or down. And long term, holding Bitcoin and also using it in the, in the economy to as a more effective payment processing system is the most beneficial way to use Bitcoin. I want to have everyone at home scared off of Bitcoin thinking that it's just for trading and speculating because it's not. There's over 20,000 merchants signed up with BitPay who right. use Bitcoin daily. Eduardo? Yes. Are you a rich man? <laughs> I am not. What's <laughs> going wrong I then? I kind of late. I mean, I discovered Bitcoin <laughs> right. uh, I was writing a piece for Upworthy back in uh, okay. March. Okay. And and now I'm just I mean I've got I've got some Bitcoin I've I've gifted Bitcoin I believe and I started my blog blacksinbitcoin.com. We are so. going to the post show okay at stream.azure.com. <laughs> you can explain how we can be rich perhaps with some Bitcoin. But right now here's Malika looking at some other stories that we're following on the stream. We turn to a Twitter hashtag that is taking the African continent by storm. Hashtag African nations in high school went viral as Africans weighed in about their country's affairs using secondary school analogies. Mentions of the hashtag hit nearly 50,000 in one day. The trend began when writer Sienda Mohitsua asked Twitter users, if your country was a student in high school, which kid would it be? She received a range of humorous responses likening Sudan and South Sudan to the couple that just had an epic breakup, and Nigeria as that kid that always has money but no one knows where they get it from. Many used the hashtag to poke fun at leaders and international organizations. This tweet compared the United Nations to an ineffective headmaster, while others poked fun at the International Monetary Fund. The hashtag was also praised for generating insight into what Africans thought of their countries. Well, do you have any ideas for this hashtag? We want you to share them with us. Tweet us at AJStream. Femi? I want to end with a good story because I gave, gave Eduardo a very hard time you about did. him not being a Bitcoin millionaire. But it's yet. actually it's inter it's interesting because he said he wasn't yet. He got in late. I'm yes. not even in it at all. Yeah, I, I'll hook you up. <laughs> uh, you. Meanwhile, Eduardo, tell us very quickly your favorite Bitcoin story because I love that story. Go ahead. Uh, wow. Um, well, my, my favorite Bitcoin story is when I gave my mom, you know, No, not some, that one. The one about, uh, hi, mom, send some Bitcoin. That, oh, yeah, that yeah, other okay, favorite so, story. Yeah, yeah. There, so there, there was a kid at, I think, uh, University, uh, Auburn University who got, made a sign with a QR code, which is like the visual representation of a Bitcoin wallet. Yeah, I got it here on my laptop. And, and he, he got behind the, the ESPN College Game Day crew, waved the sign, said, yeah. hi, mom, send, and had the Bitcoin logo and his QR sign. And he received the equivalent of $26,000 in four what? hours in Bitcoin community. Oh, my goodness. That is a fantastic story. I think even Sebastian would be impressed because by that story. Because all the rich people who early adopters like to gift Bitcoin. So Whoa. they are giving back. Okay, so you know what we're going to be doing in the post show, Malika and I, we are going to be making a Bitcoin sign. Mm -hmm. We will wave it and then the rich <laughs> early adopters will gift to the stream. We'll accept Bitcoin. Thank you very much to everybody who joined us here on the stream. What are we doing on the next program? Well, Canadian scientists are accusing their government of leading a war on knowledge and science. What do they mean by that? We'll ask them on the next show. Stay with us. The post show is next at stream.outazero.com. We'll see you online. Thanks for watching.
Hello there, this is the streamed online post show. We're talking about the digital currency Bitcoin and how it could affect the future of money and business. Let's get right back to the conversation. We've got Eduardo's story. I also want to dip into Sebastian. I know you have a story for us about Bitcoin. Share. Sure, I uh, was there at the beginning of Bitcoins, I guess, uh, and uh, the, uh, I was uh, taken to one of the bars by one of the founders of uh, so-called Bitcoin foundations. And uh, we saw, I saw the exchange for the first time in my life of Bitcoin, essentially paying for a beer. And I'm, uh, I was just astounded and, and amazed by the speed and uh, innovation and uh, originality of the entire process. It's a, it's a remarkable evolution in, in the system of payment. And uh, it's really a one step in a, in a direction, the same way as we don't have any coins in our pockets. Um, you know, we don't have any DVDs soon uh, on our computers. Right. This is uh, one step further in the evolution of payments. It was uh, a great thing to be uh, part of it. Do you think that perhaps your concern is more about the fact that you are very steeped in traditional currency and this is new? Perhaps like people who said, I'm going to read the newspaper, I'm not going to go online and read it online, and now really traditional newspapers, are, they're online. Do you feel that maybe you're just not seeing that, the that possibility? I, oh well, I, s I saw the possibility. I had to restrain myself on not investing in bitcoins because I'm afraid it's going to be uh, regulated. And I, I work actually for banks, so that's certainly not a good thing. Right. Um, because I can influence the price. But the uh, is it you know is it an evolution? Yes. Can tomorrow somebody do exactly the same thing? The answer is yes. There are already probably 30 or 40 virtual currencies which are available. Yeah. Uh, can somebody start to borrow and leverage and relend bitcoins and then create an inflation in bitcoins? The answer is maybe. I'm not sure. And so this is a process by which uh, some of these currencies, because of the way they're built, can, can die. Some of them are means of payments and will survive very well. And so some of the feature of Bitcoins, maybe when it, uh, it ends up and stabilizes uh, with the creation, I believe, 21 million uh, coins, maybe they'll have reached that level of stability or another one will have. And it will fulfill a, an important function as part of the payment system. Maybe not the biggest one, but certainly uh, one which is useful for a certain spectrum of, uh, of payments. Right. Milica. Yeah, and I, f I feel I feel though that that bank I mean the legacy banking system you know can view Bitcoin as an existential threat because it does things a lot more efficient than they do already. I mean, think about the fifty dollars to send a wire transfer and how may not you may not even get it the same day and all these other you know some sometimes arcane you know seeming uh, regulation restrictions built around our money and having access to our money. I couldn't go into to my bank today and withdraw, you know, ten thousand dollars without having to fill out a bunch of forms to give a good reason why. It's, I mean, it, Bitcoin really does give money, you know, keep money back to, to the people. And Eduardo, you said I, that the banking system sees it as a threat, but uh, from what I'm seeing online, individuals also see the risks of it. Eric on Facebook says, as with any completely new and unfamiliar entity, most people fear it and avoid it until the risk takers, like you, make it familiar. The risk takers become very wealthy. But there's also a video comment on that same topic. Have a listen to this. Hi, this is Chuck in Atlanta with my thoughts on Bitcoin. Um, it is a currency without regulation, so it is suspect to fraud and abuse and really will only favor those who got in early or at the large top percent. Eventually, I suspect that it's going to fail miserably. A lot of people will lose money. It's a high risk investment, just like anything else. You need to be careful. So Eduardo, he mentions it's really going to favor those who got in early. So as I was mentioning to Femi just as we went into the post show, am I too late? And for those of us watching who don't have any digital currency, are we too late? Absolutely not. And, and it's funny because I, I hear those type of arguments all the time. Today on my, on my blog, blacksandbitcoin.com, I posted you know, sarcastically the top 10 reasons why Bitcoin is magic internet money. Because people are, are afraid that you either have to be an early adopter or, or that it's destined to fail for a, for a number of reasons, which just pretty much translates to, to you know, fear. And, and of the unknown. And basically, uh, I mean, just from the example that my mom's, you know, Bitcoin is basically, you know, quadrupled in, in four months time, you know, shows that it's never too late to join Bitcoin because long-term valuations, and it's kind of hard to peg so, in a technology as new as Bitcoin, long-term valuations have this being worth many thousands of dollars per Bitcoin. So if anything, I say, you know, get in now, get in, you know, long and, and participate in the community, and help the currency grow. So Daniel, I know you wanted to jump in the conversation. What did you want to add? Well, I want to say that um, I, I don't know if Bitcoin is a bubble, uh, but I suspect that its its price right now does not reflect uh, its long-term value. Meaning that in the long term, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure that anyone else knows, how much Bitcoin is going to be worth. 
uh, as a currency. So there's, as I mentioned before, there's two aspects of Bitcoin. There's Bitcoin as currency, uh, like US dollars, and then there's Bitcoin as the payment system. I think the payment system and the platform of decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, currency transfer is, is what's really innovative and really valuable about Bitcoin. And that's going to that's going to last for a long can't time. Separate the two, Dan, but, because he, but, he can't separate the two. But there, are, there's no there's <clears throat> there's no reason to assume that the first major attempt at a digital peer to peer currency is going to be the one that succeeds. So it, Bitcoin has been likened to the Internet of Money. That's the platform. It right. allows lots of innovation. It allows lots of new users. Um, but the question is: Is Bitcoin as currency? Is that Pets.com in 1998, or is it Google? And the answer is, I don't know. And that really depends on the fundamentals of this specific currency. And right now, the volatility is such that to get in now would be to take a major risk. And it's entirely possible that Bitcoin could crash or steadily devalue itself from competition from other currencies. Let and me, then not I, I always tell people it's like buying a piece of email technology back in like 1992. Not AOL you know, the share of AOL, the company, but actual email technology. Because you can't separate the currency from the payment processing, from the protocol, the technology. And that's why I think Bitcoin is always going to have a value and a pretty high value. I, w I would, um, you know, respectfully kind of disagree. I, I think, however, the, uh, the Bitcoins can actually have wild fluctuations and actually move higher than they are at current levels. And the reason behind it is there's so much thirst basically uh, for uh, returns that uh, you know it's a, it's a very appealing type of asset class for somebody to take a wild speculative gamble on uh, the problem is eventually interest rates are going to rise around the world particularly in, in the US as we normalize some of this and some of the bubbly elements which happens in bitcoins which are very similar to uh, the bubble, um, the tulip bubbles that we saw in the 16th century in Holland, Sebastian, but also in other asset classes. And this will correct. Yeah, yeah, Sebastian, can I just <laughs> jump in a, in a moment? Because this conversation would not be complete without Kanye West's digital currency. Kanye. Kanye. What what is going on there? Let me ask Sebastian first of all, because he's legacy banking. So, <laughs> have you heard of this? Well, pardon me, I didn't hear. Have you heard about Kanye West in maybe coming up with his own electronic currency? Yeah, it, it reminds me also some top models from Brazil asking to be paid only in euro just before he collapsed, but yes. Right. Uh, it w well, no, it was, like, oh, like it was inspired by him. It's not actually his electronic no, actually currency. That would be too much even for Kanye West to come up with. Eduardo? <laughs> you no, know, no, I was, I mean, no, I, the thing is, that, yeah, there are dozens of other alt, uh, other, uh, alt coins, alternative yeah. uh, coins, which are largely based on the Bitcoin pro uh, protocol and the concepts. But I, I actually, you know, you know, like that stuff. I personally would not speculate on it. Now, that stuff is rank speculation because there isn't the robust ecosystem, you know, business and otherwise built around them like it is, like there are Bitcoin. But uh, I, anything that kind of brings more attention to cryptocurrencies is good. It, it's like it's you're basically helping people. But it learn doesn't it doesn't make you a laughing stock. It's like oh Bitcoin, oh then there's a Kanye coin as no, well. No, it's it's like it's like training wheels. It's like right. in, it's like in seventh grade when I got a checking account from my middle school to buy books at the school bookstore. It was like a crash course in personal finance. This Coinye and all these other all coins are like a crash coin crash course in in uh, in cryptocurrencies. All right, Malika. Well, uh, Eduardo just mentioned middle school, and I wanted to pull this up, something we saw online, this milkroad.com. It's uh, two little girls who have a, uh, a, a little shop, if you will, a little stand, and they accept Bitcoin. So this goes ahead to beg the question, taking us full circle. We showed the map at the very beginning of the show of all the places digital currency is shown. Eduardo Nafizi on Twitter wants to know, do the prom promoters of Bitcoin hope to make it a universally accepted currency? It already is to an extent. I mean, it's available in ev anywhere where there's internet. We even had—I saw a post on uh, the Bitcoin subreddit the other day, saying of someone in North Korea saying that they had they made the first Bitcoin transaction from North Korea. So it literally, it truly is an international, uh, you know, decentralized global type of currency. I know our audience watching this are trying to work out because we we always try and get more than one perspective. I think if I was watching this, I was thinking about it, I'm not what sure yeah. what I would do. Two on one. <laughs> <laughs> what? I need backup. <laughs> okay. So let me just give you that final opportunity. Malika hasn't got any Bitcoin yet. Some of our audience haven't got it yet. They still need to be persuaded. So I'm not going to wait it either way, Daniel. What's your, what's your final thought for, for the undecided out there? 
Uh, my personal decision, and I'm not going to recommend whether people buy one or the other, is I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for it to stabilize. I'm going to wait for it to become more universally accepted in the real economy. I'm going to wait to see what the government does to regulate it. But in the long term, I think the protocol, the payment system, the platform, that's what's really valuable about Bitcoin. Right. And we're going to start seeing more traditional institutions start to adopt the, be the better elements of this. Regular banks aren't going to go away, but they might start adopting things from this new innovative uh, currency payment system. Right. So I think Very that's nice. that's what's really interesting. All right, Sebastian, don't recap what we've already spoken about, but just for that last little push for somebody who's sitting watching this and is not quite sure what to do, what would you tell them? Well, I'd say innovation is, is always fascinating and participating in a, in a history in a very, very small way. It's, it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're willing to, to lose everything. And you might actually uh, have something which is worth something in the long term. So it, you're part of history. It's a great change uh, in the payment system. And as Wes pointed out, you know, we are actually seeing the adaptation of payment systems uh, globally. And Bitcoin was uh, kind of an innovator in that space. And therefore, it, it should be welcome. And if I was uh, somebody holding a lot of Bitcoin, I would give uh, a little bit of money to different charities. Very nice. Very nice of you. Eduardo, I'm going to give yeah. you the last word because you feel like you're outnumbered. Well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm a big boy. It's fine. But, uh, <laughs> and the general, community was me, on your side. Yeah, oh, well, good. I mean, yeah, we're on the side of technology and progress. <laughs> uh, but, but basically, in general, you know, ed just educate yourself. You know, there's a lot of free information about Bitcoin out there that can help sway you one way or the other. Uh, on on Reddit, you know, there's a very robust um, Bitcoin subreddit with almost 100,000 subscribers. Or a place like my like my my blog, BlacksinBitcoin.com, where I'm putting together the pieces for all communities to really access you know, the knowledge behind Bitcoin as far as uh, the, the, the economics and also the, the culture and the lifestyle. There's, it's, it's new. I mean, people are afraid of, of stuff that's new, but also wants to miss out on uh, great innovation in our history. All right. Well, thank you very much for helping us have this conversation. There is so much more to unpack and explain. But as Eduardo said, go educate yourself. Eduardo Jackson, Daniel Beer, Sebastian Galli, thank you very much for being part of the program. Last word. I said it was Eduardo, but really it's the community. <laughs> what are they saying? And they're appreciative. Eric tweets it. It's worth mentioning that virtual currency, Bitcoin, transfers power from institutions to the person. And with power comes responsibility. Very nice. So let's see what we've been doing on the next AJ stream. Canadian scientists are accusing their government of leading a war on knowledge and science. But what do I mean by that? We'll find out in the next AJ stream. Until then, we'll be online. Take care.